Hello, uh, Robin Linus. Yeah, shall I start? Yes, you shall start. Okay, Thank <laughs> thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about BitVM today, which is a way to enable smarter Bitcoin contracts. First of all, the motivation. We would like to scale Bitcoin to a billion users and beyond. And um, the issue with that is, of course, that in the long term, most users won't be able to afford main chain fees. Just today, we saw fees around like $100, mega, uh, $100 per, per transaction. And of course, um, most users will not be able to afford that in the long run, in particular when it sustains and uh, when fees will always be that high. So we would like to bridge Bitcoin to other systems. We would like to bridge BTC to sidechains, CK rollups, to other second layer protocols like CK coins. And um, yeah, that would enable rapid innovation, that would enable cheap experimentation, and it would give us all the good stuff that we currently don't have on the main layer because yeah, the main layer um, is um, very hard to change. Soft forks are hard. Um, they have very, very infrequently. And um, in general, it's very hard to change the base layer. And yeah, we would love to have lots of different L2s, a free market of layer twos that are all interconnected via Lightning. And in general, that is possible, but we need better bridges. Currently, the best bridges we have are essentially multi-sigs. And um, that is not very satisfying because it introduces you know, undesirable trust assumptions. And it would be way better if we had trust minimized or trust reduced bridges. And that is what BitVM is about. So how do we do that? The basis of all is stateful scripts. That's how it starts. And once we have stateful scripts, we can build BitVM on top of that. And once we have BitVM, we can essentially execute any kind of logic. And that allows us to build bridges on top of BitVM. So that is roughly the stack. And now I'm going to talk in more detail about these three parts. First of all, stateful Bit Bitcoin scripts. What do I mean by that? Well, we can introduce state with signatures. Actually, Bitcoin script is completely stateless. It is designed to be completely stateless. That means every script execution has essentially its own isolated environment. And there is no way to transport state or like a variable, the state of some variable from one script to another. Bitcoin script is not designed for that. However, there is a way to get around that. And um, this hack to get around that is essentially based just on signatures. The rough idea is if we could just sign a value, if we could verify in Bitcoin script signatures for arbitrary messages, then we could just sign a value. And we could simply enforce the same value, for example, for variable x in script one and script two. And the way we do that is, for example, Alice, she signs that x equals 42. And script one forces her to reveal some signature for the value of x. And Bob can watch the chain. And once he sees that, uh, that signature, he can use the same signature in script two to um, yeah, give the value 42 to x. In this way, we could transport some state from script one to script two, simply with a signature. The big problem here is how do we sign a value? Or like, how do we verify the signature for a value? And unfortunately, that is not really possible yet, kind of. Like, we could do it if we had check sig from stack, but we don't have check sig from stack yet. But there is a way around that, and that is called Lamport signatures. Um, Jeremy Rubin, he wrote, I think in 2020, a nice blog post um, about Lamport signatures. They are conceptually very simple. And that is because they require only hash functions. So there is no discrete log or something in there. It's just hash functions. And they are so simple that we can just implement them in Bitcoin script. The main drawback is that they are very large. However, they allow us to sign bytes, 32-bit words, and even hashes. 
So we can essentially sign every kind of variable that we would like to sign. And these Lamport signatures are the basis for BitVM. We could use any other signature scheme, but Lamport signatures seem to be the only signature scheme that we can uh, currently use in, BitVM, in Bitcoin Script. Um, here's a simple example of a Lamport signature for one bit message um, that is implemented in Bitcoin Script. What it does, it takes the input, like the input here would be um, a pre-image, and um, there are two hashes, there's hash one and there is hash zero, and you can provide the pre-image for hash one, and that essentially puts the value one on the stack, or you could provide the pre-image for um, hash zero, and that would put the value zero on the stack. And if you would provide any other pre-image that does not hash to hash one or hash zero, then uh, the script would just fail. And this gives us a simple Lamport signature for a one-bit message. A one-bit message is not that, in that interesting, but we could easily um, yeah, generalize this to an n-bit message just by copying the same script n times. There are a couple of optimizations that we can do there to make the script more compact, but for now, this is how Lamport signatures look. Um, the second way to introduce state in Bitcoin is to use connector outputs. Connector outputs are an ingenious concept that um, I know from ARC. ARC was introduced by Burak. I think it was also um, presented at, um, at this conference here. Um, the idea behind connector outputs is to have a transaction a conditional transaction that has as condition a, another transaction. So for example, here, this parent transaction, it consumes an input from Alice and it creates an output for Alice and Alice pre-signs this output. And uh, she, she pre-signs this output to be spent with a conditional transaction. And in her signature, she commits to another input. And that input is an output of the condition transaction. That is the transaction that Alice would like to see. So Alice essentially says, hey, Bob, you can have my money, but only if you also execute the condition transaction first. Um, this example here is pretty silly. It doesn't really uh, encode much logic, but it gives you an idea of what a connector output is. The connector output is an output that is the condition for another transaction. And this very simple concept, which is essentially just a pre-signed transaction, is extremely powerful. It is very much at the heart of BitVM, and it enables all kinds of interesting logic that um, yeah, people thought was impossible in Bitcoin. Now the BitVM architecture. The paradigm, the programming paradigm of BitVM, um, is in particular an optimistic computation program programming paradigm. Optimistic computation means that it works such that one party makes a claim. They essentially just say, hey, I think the result of the computation that we want to do is Y, some, 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 some output. And if that value is correct, if, if the result that this party claims, if that is the correct result, then everybody agrees and um, nothing happens. Nothing fancy happens. It's for everybody who's watching the chain and just looks like a regular transaction. Only in case of a dispute, so only if that result is incorrect, then you start the entire BitVM. Then you disprove the result. And the interesting thing here is that disproving something or disproving a computation is much easier than executing the entire computation. Um, that is easy to see in simple examples. For example, um, if you give me two even numbers and ask me to multiply them, and I give you as a result an odd number, then you can be immediately certain that my result is incorrect because you know that when I multiply two even numbers, the result has to be an even number as well. So you have to look only at the smallest bit to disprove my, um, my assertion. Um, multiplication, or like this, this was like a very simple example. A bit more sophisticated example would be, for example, um, the square root. Like if you want me, if you ask me to to calculate the square root of a number, 
then I can give you the result and you can, um, you can check the result simply by multiplying it with itself. And multiplying a number is much easier than calculating the square root. And this nicely demonstrates that it is often the case that um, checking a result or disproving a result is much easier than computing the result yourself. And this fact um, is used very heavily in, in BitVM in general. Like we always just disprove something. We never execute the entire computation. We just look for like one mistake to disprove um, a faulty assertion. And um, yeah, we can use that to compute essentially any kind of function. But what we are using it in particular for is a snark verifier. A snark is a succinct argument of knowledge, essentially like um, a proof of computation. And that allows us to compress essentially infinite amounts of computation into a constant size proof. And we can check that proof in BitVM simply by somebody making an assertion saying, hey, this is a correct proof. And if that proof is incorrect, then we will disprove some, uh, something about the computation. And I will go into more detail now how that works. First of all, we have to talk more about advanced Bitcoin scripts. Um, yeah, we have implemented a language that allows us to express complex Bitcoin contracts. contracts. Um, this language com consists of a templating language for script, which allows us to unroll loops. Like Bitcoin script doesn't have loops. It's not Turing complete. So whenever we want to loop something, we just have to copy the same script that many times as, as often as we want to loop it. Um, would be pretty annoying to do that by hand. So we have the templating language that does that, 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 does that for us. Then another thing is to compose functions. Um, Bitcoin script is essentially very much like assembly or something. It doesn't have any uh, notion of functions, really. Um, so we just implemented that in our templating language on top. And we use this language to then also provide a library of um, low-level primitives that are very useful in many um, applications. For example, bitwise operations, XOR, shift, also multiplication, which is not available in Bitcoin script natively, and also more high-level things like um, Blake 3 arithmetic, uh, Blake 3 hashing, or also field arithmetic, which is at the heart of um, the snark verifier in particular. And yeah, also our language has nice primitives to for, for the statefulness, in particular these Lamport signatures and connector outputs. And um, all of that can be used to compile, yeah, to compile logic into potentially complex scripts, complex tab trees, and large graphs of transactions. So it's not just scripts, it's graphs of transactions. And we use that language to build then bridges on top of BitVM. Um, the goal is to bridge BTC to any other system. Um, and the rough idea is that even if the if that bridge is a bit clunky, it's still fine because uh, it is it is fine if the bridge is used only rarely, only by large liquidity providers that use it for large amounts, because end users can just use cross-chain swaps ideally via lightning. And um, that's, um, that allows us to use the bridge very rarely. So it is, it is totally fine if it's a bit clunky. And um, in our bridge, we have a fixed set of operators. So those are the people who um, yeah, operate the bridge. But anyone can be a verifier. In our first design, it was such that the set of verifiers is also fixed. But um, in our new design that we call BitVM2, um, anyone can be a verifier, which makes the security much stronger. Now the guarantees. Um, it is essentially a federation, but it's different than regular federations because a, just a single honest member is required for the bridge to be safe and secure. Um, it has a trusted setup. And we think we can have roughly a thousand participants in that trusted setup. And then we can have roughly a hundred bridge operators. And of course, they should be mutually distrusting and, and stuff like that. So they don't all co collude with each other. And the guarantees of that 
setup is um, the bridge is safe, which means nobody can steal deposits if one of these thousand participants is honest. So the trusted setup, if one of these thousand participants is honest and deletes their key, then nobody can steal any money from the bridge. And the second one, the bridge is live, which means nobody can stop a valid pegout if one of these bridge operators is honest. If all of these bridge operators are dishonest, they still cannot steal any money from the bridge, but the bridge would, would hold. However, uh, what's nice here is that the game theory is such that um, yeah, the bridge operators don't really have an incentive to collude with each other to stop the bridge and then uh, blackmail people because um, yeah, the expected value of that is lower than what a user could offer them. Um, so it's, it's quite a safe assumption, I would say. And to make it even better, you can become a member. Of course, not everybody can become a member. We uh, have just 100 operators at most. But if you are a large liquidity provider, for example, an exchange or something, then uh, you can become a member and then you don't have to trust anyone because you are that one honest party. And if there's one honest party, then uh, the bridge is safe and live. Here is um, a rough model of how the bridge would look like. Um, we are using connector outputs here. Um, so the, during pegging, Alice pegs in 100 BTC and she sends it to an N of N. So that would be a thousand of thousand um, output. We can nicely compress that into a single signature using music. And um, this committee would pre-sign the pegout transaction. And that pegout transaction would give the money just to the operator. Um, I'm glossing over a lot of details here. This is just for you to give, get like a um, rough idea how the how the pegout mechanism or the bridge mechanism works. Um, and then in, in, in the next slide, I will go into more detail. Um, but this is like the the key the key part, the key mechanism. So and um, when the operator witnesses um, a valid pegout in the sidechain, like in the sidechain, let's say um, Bob. He wants to peg out, then he burns his uh, his sidechain coins, and burning the sidechain coins essentially um, this is the way how he communicates to the operator that he would like to peg out. And then the operator says, "Yeah, I witnessed um, a valid peg out, so I'm gonna put my kickoff transaction on on chain." And once he puts the kickoff transaction on chain, he has to wait for, for example, six months until he can execute that pegout transaction because that pegout transaction committed to both these inputs, like to this input and to that input. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. I'm not sure if you can, but um, yeah, to output two and three of the pegout transaction, uh, sorry, input two and three of the pegout transaction. And what the operator is essentially betting on is that nothing happens to his connector output. If anything happens to his connector output, then he essentially destroys the pegout transaction and he will not be able to take the funds. And his connector output is tied to the slash transaction. Like the operator has pre signed the slash transaction. And the slash transaction essentially expresses here with the BitVM, which is just a black box for now. Um, it expresses that if the watchtower wins the game against the operator, then the watchtower wins. An uh, um, the Watchtower wins an output that allows him to complete the slash transaction. And then the Watchtower can execute the slash transaction, essentially spending the connector output of the operator and rendering the pegout um, transaction obsolete. So the operator will not be able to execute the pegout transaction because his connector output was burned. If the operator was honest, then the watchtower cannot win the game, and then he cannot win the output, so he cannot execute the slash transaction, so nothing happens to the connector output, and in six months, the operator can just take the money. That is the rough mechanism. Of course, there are a couple of flaws here. For example, the money just goes to the operator. Why does the money go to the operator and not to Bob? That's a good question. Um, I will show you in the next slide um, how that is solved. And um, yeah, there are a couple other issues with this model, but it gives you an idea how to use Bitcoin transactions 
to yeah, essentially um, represent a bridge mechanism. So now the question is, how do we replace this black box there with the snack verifier? Well, pairing-based proofs, they are constant size. For example, gross 16, flunk verifier, stuff like that. Um, all of them are constant size. However, an implementation of these verifiers is still extremely large. It's, it's gigabytes if you implement it in Bitcoin script. Bitcoin script is so simple, like it cannot even do multiplication. It can only do additions and stuff like that. So whenever you want to do like a field multiplication, you have to do like crazy amounts of additions. And that essentially results in gigabytes of opcodes that you have to, uh, yeah, to, to compile to essentially have a snark verifier. And of course, the script size limit is just four megabytes. Like a block is at most four megabytes and the script size of a taproot script is um, four megabytes, so we can just have at most four megabytes. So how does that fit together? How can we have a snark verifier, which is gigabytes, if we only can execute at most four megabytes? Well, the idea is we can commit to about a thousand intermediate results. So for example, if we have some function f of x equals y, here, F would be the snark verifier, X would be some proof, and Y would be some statement that the proof proves. And we want to execute this function, which is gigabytes. We simply split it up into smaller parts. For example, F1 of X equals Z1, and F2 of Z1 equals Z2, F3 of Z2 equals Z3, and so on and so on until f of 1000 of z999 equals y. So now instead of f, which is way too large, we now have um, a thousand smaller functions. And the idea here is disproving a single step suffice. Like, for example, if f of 42, or, no, sorry, f42 of z41 is not equal to Z42, then we just execute that particular function and disprove it. We disprove the result, like we disprove that Z42, which the operator claimed is not correct. And this is enough to disprove the entire claim of the operator because the operator claimed that F of X equals Y. And if we find any FI that is not correct, then we disprove that claim. And yeah, every FI here can be up to four megabytes. So we have a thousand FIs, that is four gigabytes in total. And this is how we essentially split up a script that is gigabytes in size into smaller chunks that are small enough to fit into the script size limit. And that is the core of BitVM2 because this is just a two-step process. There is only two rounds. The operator makes a claim, they say they commit to X and Y and all the intermediate value, values. And if any of these intermediate steps is incorrect, then they get disproven in a single step. Just for example, here F42 is executed. And this is how we, um, how we, ex how we can essentially run more or less arbitrarily large um, scripts in Bitcoin. And we put that into our bridge design. Our bridge design, is a, this one is a bit more complex. Um, it also solves the problem that we actually wanted to give the money to Bob. And the trick for that is just that the operator essentially does a swap with Bob. So um, it's, it's still the same setup. Like in the, here we have the peg-in transaction and during peg-in uh, we do pre-sign the take transaction. Um, which is essentially the peg out transaction. But uh, now we have two different take transactions. We have the take transaction for the happy part, which is take one, and we have take transaction two, which is um, for the unhappy part. This is um, when the operator got challenged by a dishonest verifier, like when an honest operator got challenged by the dishonest verifier. So somebody claimed, no, the operator claimed something that was correct, and then a dishonest verifier said, no, that's incorrect. Yep. And the operator proved that it was correct, and then he can execute the take two transaction. That's the rationale behind that. And um, the take some of this slack there, but 
don't tug. Mm. Okay, I'm don't tug. I can hit someone now? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll just continue. Um, yeah, so Alice has packed in her money and then she uh, used it on the sidechain and in the sidechain it circulated and at some point it arrived at Bob. And Bob decides that he wants to pack out, so he burns his sidechain coins. Then the operator witnesses that um, Bob burned his coins, so the operator gives his own money, just his own 100 BTC, he gives them to Bob. And then he puts his kickoff transaction on chain, essentially saying, hey, all of you witnessed that Bob did a valid pack out and I gave my money to Bob. So now I am entitled to take the money that is in the bridge. And he commits to Y here, which is essentially the statement. This, uh, the statement would be the, the state of the chain, the state of the Bitcoin chain, essentially, saying, hey, this is a block header that con that commits to a chain that contains this valid packout transaction. And after executing his kickoff transaction, he has two weeks, or he has to wait two weeks. And um, during these two weeks, he hopes that nothing happens to his connector outputs. If somebody disagrees with um, the statement of the operator, then they can take they can execute the challenge transaction. The challenge transaction essentially does nothing except for destroying the connector output A. When the connector output A is destroyed, then the take one transaction is destroyed. Hello. You cannot execute the take one transaction Robin, without A. Quick, quick, yeah. Um, I don't know if you could get, we have a five minute warning. I just wanted to give it to you. I was trying to put it in the chat, but okay. yes. five minutes, is that good or? Yeah, I, I think I can make it, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, anyone can execute the challenge transaction, which they can execute only if they give one BTC to the operator. And that forces the operator to go down this path. And here, in, then, uh, yeah, they, they're forcing the operator to execute the assert transaction. And in the assert transaction, or like to execute the assert transaction, they have to make a commitment to X and Z1, Z2, Z3 to Z99. And then they have to wait another two weeks to execute the take two transaction. Uh, and until then, everyone can disprove any um, intermediate step. For example, here they disprove F42 of Z41 is not equal to Z42. And there's essentially like a huge tap tree with a thousand leaves and one leaf for every intermediate step. And if any of the intermediate steps is incorrect, they can just execute the disprove transaction, rendering the take two transaction obsolete. And um, this is roughly how the bridge design works. Um, the limitations. First of all, there's lots of complexity. Like um, implementing these scripts is very complex. And um, yeah, we would rather have something way more simple, but um, yeah, but it's the best we can do so far. The other thing is we have to balance the incentives. So the loser should always pay the winner's fees and the bounty. So whenever someone is dishonest, you're not sad, you're happy that someone is dishonest because you can make a profit from that. Like whenever somebody lies, then they will lose money at the end. <laughs> And yeah, if the incentives are balanced, then the chain is probably never never needed because it would be stupid to lie because when you lie, you will certainly lose your money. Um, yeah, the problem here is, or like one of the problems here is that the uh, operator has to front the capital for two weeks. However, um, yeah, in practice, it will be um, not 100 BTC or something, it will be maybe 10 BTC coins or so, so it will be smaller amounts and you don't have to front the entire capital that is locked into the bridge, but just like um, one particular uh, chunk that is currently um, yeah, in, the, in the process. And once the packout process is completed, so after two weeks, you can just reuse your capital, of course, and process more packouts if you want to. But probably packouts will just occur very rarely, and um, it will never come to, uh, yeah, to situations where um, liquidity is short or something. Um, yeah, and no one-to-one -one collateral is required. There are already bridge designs that exist today, but um, most of them are over-collateralized. 
Like you need as much collateral as there is money in the bridge. Here you don't need it at all. You just at most need the money um, for a single pack out. And one of the main limitations is that for every peg in all thousand parties have to pre-sign. So you will probably not be able to peg in any time you want. There will be just um, batched peg-ins. So once or twice a year you can peg in. You can peg out any time, but peg in is um, clunky, and slow, so it won't happen very often. And the other issue is the Federation can censor peg ins if they want to. If somebody refuses to sign your peg in, like one of uh, of the Federation members, then you just cannot peg in. Summary: BitVM enables smarter Bitcoin contracts. The main use case is trust reduced bridges for layer twos in particular, sidechains, ZK rollups, and stuff like ZK coins. The main limitation is that it's clunky, but still practical. And what's great about it is that it requires no soft fork at all. Like it works on today's Bitcoin just as it is. It would be way better if we had TX hash. Um, TX hash would allow us to get rid of the trusted setup. Um, multiplication would be super great because that would extremely compressed the, the, the size. And even better would be if we had op block hash, which would be an op code push the latest block hash on, onto the stack. We have completed a um, very simple draft version, and we hope to release a quote unquote reckless mainnet version by the end of this year. Okay. Um, I think I don't have much time for questions. So essentially that's it. Thank you.